Well, this uh, account of Jesus healing the paralytic is probably one of the best known stories uh, contained in the Bible. In fact, many of us who may have grown up in the church might be able to think back and remember the the Sunday school lesson where you learned about this story, the story of the paralytic. How many of you out there uh, maybe remember either teaching with or being taught by a flannel graph display? Wow, more people than I thought. Flannel graph. How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say flannel graph display? Look around, folks. See, this is what I like about this family of believers. This congregation, we have quite a healthy cross-section of folks, and our demographic is quite varied. Flannel graph is just what it kind of represents, what it suggests. You've got this this display. This this is technology. This is like high-tech stuff back in the 1900s. (laughs) Imagine that back in the 1900s. But we would uh, have like a, a flannel display and then you'd have all the characters and, and you would place them on the display and just those two pieces of fabric together would keep that thing right there fixed and in place. Hey, we, there was no teaching with PowerPoint or, or any kind of multimedia technology. That was the technology. But anyway, this story could very easily be diminished to that of a mere narrative. But the story of Jesus healing the paralytic is so much bigger than a flannel graph display or the mere, the mere understanding of this narrative of something incredible that Jesus did. There are several different characters contained within the story, and, and, um, and these characters contained within the story played a, a very important role in a very important spiritual lesson that Jesus taught to have his audience understand. Yes, there was a miracle. Yes, a a paralyzed man was made to walk. Yes, that was incredible what Jesus did because it authenticated the claim that he made. But it's more than a story. It's a lesson about something quite significant. And that's what I want us to be able to see today. The setting, any good story, if you will, has to have a setting. Setting includes both time and place. Verse 1 gives us the setting. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Somebody was asking me yesterday, do you know where, do you know where one of my kids was? And the answer was, he's at home. And so what was the suggestion? That he was at his own personal residence, which happens to be mine. He was at home, right? However... We don't know that Jesus was at his own personal private residence. Perhaps it would have been better in translation to have added the indefinite article, he was at a home. Now that home that he may have been at could have been Peter's and and Andrew's home. And in fact, many scholars believe that to be the case. Some have suggested it may have been at the home of his mother who had uh, uh, perhaps had taken up residence in Capernaum. We know Capernaum had become his home base of operations for his Galilean ministry. He had taught in his hometown. He himself commented, a prophet is not welcome in his hometown. Why? Everybody grew up with him. Everybody knew him. He tried to preach a message, and they wanted to take him up on top of a mountain and throw him down and and make him crash on the cliffs. He was run out of his hometown of Nazareth. And so he took up his, uh, his ministry in the Galilean wilderness, And Capernaum was there, and he was in a home. Now, hospitality was well understood in ancient Eastern culture. People didn't need an invitation the way we Americans do. They just showed up. They were there. They didn't set play dates with each other. They didn't didn't set uh, dates to come and that are weeks in advance, if they wanted to go, it was an open door sort of a policy. Hospitality was well understood. And so people heard that Jesus was at home and they were there at that home. They were there en masse. And they were there because they had heard about this miracle worker, Jesus. 
They had heard about the, the uh, demon-possessed man in the temple who had had that demon cast out of him. They had heard about the leprous man who had had his leprosy cured. And there were hosts of other healings that undoubtedly would have taken place up until this point in time that aren't contained within the account that we have before us in this fast-moving account from the gospel according to Mark. But what we do know is this, that many people were there. They had crowded the house. They were, they were in the house. They were outside of the house. It was standing room only. You couldn't get to the door of the house. It was crowded, and there were these four friends of a paralyzed man who came bringing him laying on a bed, and they couldn't get to the door. That tells me a little bit about the mentality of the crowd that was there. They didn't have enough goodwill or decency, it seems, to be able to allow them to take this man who undoubtedly had a very deep need to be able to get close to the door. It speaks to me a little bit about the mentality of that curious crowd. It was a curious crowd. So these four friends of a paralyzed man decided to, to circumnavigate the crowd. And they decided to go up on top of the rooftop and lower this man right in front of Jesus. They trusted that Jesus would heal him, and that's exactly what Jesus did. This miracle of healing gave our Lord the opportunity to be able to teach a very important lesson to that gathered crowd. This is the setting of our story. But like I said, this is way more than a story. We can learn lessons that Jesus taught by examining this story. And every good story, besides the setting, has to have a cast of characters. And this is how I want us to walk through the story is to walk through the story and consider the characters who played an important role in the lesson that Jesus wanted to teach. And this is how I've organized it. First, we see the curious crowd. The curious crowd. Notice I didn't call it the committed crowd. They were a curious crowd. Jesus, in, in chapter 1, verse 28, said that after a dramatic rescue of a demon-possessed man, that, quote, at once, we know this from Mark, at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Jesus had attracted crowds. They had heard about the miracle worker. They had heard about the amazing things that were being done. They had heard about the healings. They had heard about the demon exorcisms. They had heard about Jesus. It was astonishing to them. It was something that they had never seen before, and they, they were curious to be able to see who this man was. This is why Jesus decided that at the climax of what was happening, that it was time to go to other towns and preach the gospel, for this is why I came out. Why not stay and capitalize on the popularity? He said, the work has exhausted itself here. It's time to go elsewhere and preach there also. This is why I conclude that this was a curious crowd. It was a curious crowd. Jesus actually avoided the crowds after he had departed and after he had healed the leprous man because the leprous man made it very difficult for him to be able to conduct his, his ministry at that point. The leprous man had, said, had been told by Jesus, go and be sure to tell no one, but go to the priest so that he can take you through the ceremonial cleansing that is prescribed in Leviticus chapter 14. And the man disobeyed and he went and he told everybody. And now Jesus is, is unable to, to go into any city. And his ministry is going to be confined to the outskirts of cities because he just can't get there to be able to do what needs to be done. The crowds, listen, were actually an obstruction to Jesus' ministry work. And here I took note of my first application. The crowds were an obstruction to his ministry. So my question to you is, do numbers of attenders prove ministry success? Absolutely not. 
For Jesus, the crowds were no measure of ministry success. The crowds were no measure of success, if you will, which is measured in spiritual terms. The spiritual success that any minister of the gospel seeks to be able to quantify is in those who place their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ and genuine salvation is evident because of the of the behavior, the changed life of the individual, that is success in ministry. And it has everything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark doesn't say the crowds were coming to Jesus in repentance and faith. He says the crowds were gathered there and they were packed very tightly together. Sure, maybe encouraging for a speaker. Sure, maybe it offers a little bit of energy. But you know what? Jesus Christ knows the heart of every man. He knows what is in man. And he knows the condition of the hearts of the people who are flocking to see him. It was a small number of people who were genuinely interested in confession and repentance. The large number of people were interested in the extraordinary works that were being communicated that he was in the process of doing. Generally speaking, the crowd was curious. There were, like I said, peppered throughout, true followers and true believers, but they were a small minority. The people, like I said, echoed this sentiment. Mark chapter 1, verse 27. It's a new teaching with authority. What is this? We've never heard anything like this. And they wanted to go and see and hear for themselves, which is why even scribes and Pharisees, teachers of the law, were present because they wanted to hear who this man was and what this was all about. So we see a crowd of people, all sorts of people, Disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, sick people, disabled people, scribes, Pharisees, all at this house. It was a curious crowd. Next, we turn our attention. Verse 3. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Four friends to be connected with what word? They. So this is the next group of participants in this story. The friends. Four friends. Three qualities I see of the paralytic's friends according to these verses. Number one, they were deeply concerned about their friend and they wanted to see that he get the help that he needed. They were deeply concerned about their friend and they wanted him to get the help that he needed. Listen, imagine this. Four friends walking from I don't know where, but this man is an adult man He's on a bed, some translations say pallet, and they carry this man on this bed or on this platform, on this pallet, and they are carrying him to the house. And they are trying to get to the door and they can't get to the door. Nobody's about to move and and give up their spot where they can see the shaman doing his his work. And so they decide to, to go around and circumnavigate the crowd. Most homes in that day had flat roofs, and they were not pitched with gable ends like this. You did not have roof rafters that would have been been going from the ridge down. They would not have been covered with plywood to add rigidity. They would not have then a layer of, and Jeff Seymour, tell me if I'm getting this right, they would not have had a layer of, of asphalt paper on top, nor ice shield down towards the bottom, and then shingles that, that were all making this a very complicated, that requires when you want to cut into it a skill saw to be able to set it, get it down, and that's a big process, right? This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a flat roof, and this flat roof was thatched. There would have been sticks, maybe timbers that would have been space. 
They probably would have had some cross pieces on it. And then they would have, uh, some translations say tiles that were removed, but they would have had straw, and then there would have been mud. And, and there's uh, also, um, there's evidence that in that time they would have taken this mud, packed it in, and then they would have had like a heavy roller that they would go over it and try to pack it down. And it almost became like tiles if they didn't use tiles themselves to be able to waterproof this dwelling. This is the scene. This is what we're talking about. These four men, there's something else. They didn't have interior stairways in their homes. It would have been an exterior stairway. A lot of uh, business sometimes and, and gathering together and, and, um, and um, communing together, meals together, sitting together, talking together, often was done on the rooftop in the evening, covered to escape the heat that would have been trapped inside of the home. And so a lot of things were done on on top. And so this exterior stairway is where they would have carried now this paralytic man up to the top of the stairs and then onto the roof. They were deeply concerned about their friend and they were willing to go to extreme measures in order to get their friend the help that he needed. What an example for the body of Jesus Christ is what comes to my mind. What an example that these friends really understood the need and wanted to be, to be able to play a part in helping to meet the need of their disabled friend. To what extent would you be willing to go to help a friend in need? We see the example of these four faithful friends, but what to what extent would you be willing to go to help to meet a need? Well, let me ask a different question. What barriers exist in your life that keep you from taking a step toward meeting people's greatest need, which is the gospel? We have opportunity to be able to be like these four friends, especially within the body of Jesus Christ, which consists of genuine believers knit together with a common bond that is Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the question is, what barriers exist in your life that keep you from ministering to people and to those generally who need to hear? Number two, the other quality I see of these faithful friends is that they had the faith to believe that Jesus could and would meet his need. Listen, concerning their friend who was paralyzed, they didn't stop with, we'll pray about that. Don't misunderstand me. Prayer is effective. The prayer of the righteous avails much. Where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst of you. Pray as the Lord taught us to pray. Scripture is filled with admonitions to pray. I'm not diminishing the value or the need for prayer. But sometimes you got to put feet to the prayer. And they put their feet to the prayer. And these faithful friends were just that indeed faithful. They didn't permit the difficult circumstances to dissuade them from what needed to be done. They didn't, they didn't allow the, even a uh, blocked entryway to dissuade them. They didn't allow a covered roof that was waterproof to dissuade them. Here's something we need to understand about faith. Biblically, faith is always linked to action. It's always linked to action. James chapter 2, verse 17 Faith without works is dead. Faith acts. Faith overcomes. Faith pursues. Faith is unrelenting. So we know that these faithful friends indeed had the faith and believed that Jesus could and would meet the need. Because we know later Jesus says, and when he saw their faith. So they were faithful. Number three, they worked together and dared to do something different. 
They worked together and dared to do something different. Imagine the scene. I've already described to you what an ancient thatched roof system would have looked like. Just imagine this. Jesus is in the middle of the room. People are all around. They're packed at the doorway, extending out as far as as one could see. I have no idea, but we know that the place was absolutely crowded. And these men go, and they carry their friend up onto the rooftop, careful to not fall through. And then they begin digging at the roof. Digging, because that's how you would uncover a thatched roof. The man is on his bed. It's some kind of a pallet. I don't know how big the guy was, but I would have to imagine the opening that would have been made had to have been big enough for that bed on which the man was lying to be able to be lowered down. And they timed it, and and they, they must have been able to measure pretty well, a whole lot better than I can measure when I'm doing carpentry. And they measured in such a way that they were able to lower him down right there in front of Jesus. And it didn't happen instantaneously. So Jesus is preaching and teaching. All the while, you're you're hearing whatever else is happening. And the mud is falling down. And I I have to imagine the Lord Jesus Christ, as the dirt is crumbling above, and as the hole appears, it it continues to grow. Commotion is heard, and, and people are distracted. And I have to imagine the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing the heart of man, must have just had this grin. I don't think he got mad. He what was the outcome of the story? He healed the man. But listen, they worked together. They didn't say, ah, well, it was a good try, but we couldn't get you there, so maybe next time. They were unrelenting. Their faith was put to action. They believed that he could do it. They went to the top of the roof. They began destroying Peter and Andrew's roof. And they worked together and adapted to their circumstances. We are doing some things here at Calvary Bible Church that are different than the way that we have done them in the past. Sometimes when we see that things are happening differently, we might be inclined to conclude that we're not doing these things when the reality is that we're actually doing them maybe more efficiently and maybe even better, but because it's not happening the way you're accustomed to it happening, you think that it's not actually happening. Pooey. See, the, the scene here is that these men adapted to their circumstances and they went out of the ordinary and they did something different. Their faith was put to action, and they, they, they went to set out to accomplish this thing that they believed in their heart of hearts needed to be done for their sick friends. So they worked together to do something different. They had the faith to believe that Jesus could and would meet their friend's need, and they were deeply concerned about their friend and wanted to see him helped. So we see the curious crowd, we see faithful friends, and now we turn our attention to the paralytic person. The paralytic person. I could have called him a paralytic man, but in case you couldn't tell, I was trying to have the adjective and the noun match with the first letter. I I don't know why, it's just the teacher in me. So he got this paralytic person, but he was a man. This man's friends carried the paralyzed man to Jesus. He was totally immobile. He was carried by others, unable to enter the house on his own. And I can't help but see the application here. Have we carried anyone to Jesus? Have you carried anyone to Jesus? Maybe you have family who do not believe and they need to hear about the real Jesus. They need to hear, yes, about the miracle working Jesus because it it authenticated his, his divine claims. But do they know about the, 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 uh, the 
sovereign Jesus? Do they know about incarnate God? Do they know about at the cross Jesus? Do they know about resurrected Jesus? Do they, do they, have they heard the gospel that they need to hear? You may be their closest link to be able to communicate that gospel message. Are you carrying your family to Jesus? How about your friends? How about your coworkers? How about those within our community? Start with a conversation. Start with a testimony that's not compromising. Allow them to see who you really are and who you claim to be. Allow that trust to develop in that consistency where they see Christ in you. Develop a conversation with them. Allow Jesus Christ to be carried by way of your testimony to those who are around you. That's one application that I see. Are we sharing his word? Are we showing his love? Are we demonstrating his compassion? Are we deferring to one another out of love? Are we communicating the true, the real, the complete gospel message? Are we speaking the truth to one another in love? This is what I mean. Are you carrying anyone to Jesus? The action in this story, in every good story, has to have action. That's what plots are made of. And as the plot thickens and as the, as the mood and as the story intensifies, we get to a climax and then we have the explosion. And that's where we're captivated by a good story. And the action in this story begins with the paralytic and it climaxes with Jesus. We could all call the paralytic a believing sinner. A believing sinner. That the man would agree to his friend's lunacy... I mean, really? We're going to now lower you down on this here gurney to the floor below. Yes, that's a great idea. <laughs> that he would agree to this suggests to me that he really did believe that Jesus could heal him. His four friends must have believed likewise because verse 5 it says, and when Jesus saw their faith. And so when the man was lowered through the hole in the roof and the Savior saw him there, right in front of him on the floor, Jesus reaches out his hand and immediately heals him. No. He says, son, stop right there. Son, son, son. Do you capture the endearing nature of Jesus and his words to that paralytic man? It's this child. Child of what? He was a, he was a, a child of God. And, and we, we can see that this, that this man, what an amazing statement that Jesus made here, and one that we'll get to in a moment. But notice that as he addresses him as son, he skipped over the paralysis in his body. Son, your sins are forgiven. And there's no record that he said, great, but what about my body? You see, Jesus skipped over the paralysis in that moment because he cut to the heart of the matter. And what was it but the heart? He went straight to his heart. Because as we learned last week, all of us are spiritual lepers before we come to Jesus Christ. And we are all in desperate need of a Savior. And that is a matter, that spiritual leprosy that we all have been afflicted with. The only cleansing that can come is through the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's tree. And Jesus has not yet gone to the cross, but he is God. And he proclaims forgiveness as only God can do. 
Son, your sins are forgiven. Matthew's account, chapter 9, verse 2, actually qualifies this a little bit better. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. So it may seem strange that Jesus forgave him first rather than heal him, but Jesus' purpose will be clear in just a moment. Are any of you scratching your heads wondering why we have not been emphasizing the Lord Jesus Christ? Practically speaking, it is my biggest point, so just track with me here. Jesus' purpose will be clear in a moment. Next, though, we see scorning scribes. Scorning scribes. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Luke chapter 5, verse 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question him, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So we know that there were teachers of the law. Religious leaders were present. Scribes and Pharisees were there. So we know from Scripture that both groups were there. Any religious leader was there. They were, at this point, beginning to dog the steps of Jesus. They wanted to know who this man was. They were hearing what he was saying. They were piecing things together because they were well-educated about the law and the prophets. They heard what Jesus was saying. They knew that his claims were, were to the divine. They knew that he was performing miracles that only one, not from this earth, could perform. And they were trying to wrap their brains around it. They were actually doing the first good thing, which was to protect the integrity of the message. They were the spiritual protectors of Israel. So the fact that they were there is not bad. The problem is their motive. The problem was their dirty hearts. The problem was that they had an agenda, and they came with that agenda. And they didn't have open minds to hear what he was saying. The Pharisees were the fundamentalists, the legalists, the promoters of salvation by works, the promoters of salvation by way of self-righteousness. The Pharisees dominated the Jewish people. They were lay people. They were not priests. They were committed mostly to maintaining tradition. They had a complex set of regulations that were extra biblical. They went beyond we learned that concerning leprosy, that we had Levitical law, and then we had everything that was added to it, traditionally speaking. They were vicious in protecting this man-made religious system that places them at the top. They had a superiority complex. And remember that the Apostle Paul, before he came to Christ, was actually named Saul, and he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. The scribes... Whereas the Pharisees are the teachers and the preachers, the scribes were the theologians, if you want to think of it in that way. Theologians are those who assemble the text. If you want to think of it educationally, you've got the teachers and then you've got the content specialists who are the ones doing the syllabus writing. So you've got the writers of the syllabus, the theologians. They are the scribes. They belong to the Pharisee system. And the scribes assembled the content. They were the scholars. So we have the Pharisees and we have the scribes, the religious leaders of the day, and they are all gathered there at this house. So these scholars and preachers and teachers were at this house, and, and that is what is important. That's what we need to understand. They were there to protect their turf. They wanted to be able to trap Jesus. They saw Jesus as a threat to their very nice, comfortable religious system. They wanted to trap him in some blasphemy, like claiming to be something that they believed he was not God. And this is where the plot thickens. Finally, we see the sovereign Savior, the sovereign Savior. And the sovereign Savior is at the center of the entire narrative. He's at the center of the whole thing. Consider this scene through the eyes of the Lord Jesus. Get behind him. See what he sees. 
look as though you, you have his vantage point. You're just behind him. You're looking over a shoulder, and you see what Jesus is seeing. And if we take that posture, then we can see that he looks up, and he sees the paralytic and his friends. When the paralytic is lowered, he then looks down, and he sees the paralyzed man with his need before him. When he looks around, he sees the scribes and the Pharisees and the curious crowd that is all about. Then when he looks within, he sees what's in the heart of man because he knows everything. So we know that he must have looked up, according to verse 4, to see the four men on the roof with their sick friend digging away to get through that roof to be able to lower their friend down. I believe two things about that moment concerning Jesus. Number one, that he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. This would be consistent. Context is everything. Jesus was moved with compassion concerning the woman at the well. Jesus was moved with compassion concerning the leprous man. Jesus was moved with compassion concerning Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus was moved with compassion concerning people. He was moved with with compassion. I was listening to a well-known pastor preach on this text, and he said, and I quote, I have preached in many congregations, and it is maddening to have distractions and disturbances direct people's attention away from the one who is speaking. His takeaway seemed to be the interruption that happens sometimes in a worship service. He never had cell phones going off in his worship service. He never had little, little babies uh, crying out during the, the worship service. We've had someone fall down and have to be taken out with, with EMS within the worship service. It doesn't madden me. It doesn't upset me. In fact, when babies cry, I get kind of happy because I know that the next generation has the opportunity to be, opportunity to be nurtured within this fellowship of believers to become that next generation of Christ followers. That actually makes me happy. Cry on, babies. (laughs) I don't think Jesus felt the way that particular preacher was expressing his sentiment. I believe that Jesus wasn't irritated or concerned. I believe that, that he knew that he had an opportunity. And I think that he saw the need of people all around him, especially this paralyzed man that was going to end up at his feet. And he saw that man and his friends, number two. He was moved with compassion and he saw their faith. He saw their faith. This paralyzed man and his friends believed that Jesus could and would heal the man. Their faith, it was their confident assurance in Jesus' ability to perform this incredible miracle of physical healing to bring healing to this man's atrophied arms his atrophied legs they were frozen in place they had to he was paralyzed for a long time no way that he was going to get up and walk out of there unless jesus moved with compassion meets his physical need those friends believed that jesus could do the impossible So Jesus looked up, and that's what he saw. He saw need. Jesus saw need, and he was moved with compassion. Jesus looked down, and he saw the paralyzed man at his feet. Remember, that man believed that Jesus could perform an incredible miracle. He believed that. He wouldn't have gone through all that process if he didn't believe it. He believed it. And Jesus looked down, and he saw the paralytic lying there, And Jesus performed the greatest miracle he had ever and would ever perform. What was it? Oh, you people are just too much on the ball. Good job. Listen, here's the big idea. The greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed was not making a paralyzed man get up and walk instantaneously. The greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed was one that cost the greatest price. By grace, you have been saved. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's tree. 
When he purchased our redemption, that purchase infers tremendous price. The price was his life. His blood ran down. He was humiliated, mocked, scorned, beaten beyond recognition. Then he went to the cross and allowed himself to be nailed to it, suffering in a manner that you can't even possibly comprehend. That's the miracle of forgiveness, that God would love humanity in that way that he would send his one and only son to die on Calvary's tree. That's the greatest miracle that was ever performed. The paralytic man's greatest need was not to be healed of his paralysis, which is why Jesus leapt right over the paralysis and went straight to the heart. His greatest need was in his heart. He wasn't just suffering from paralysis. He was suffering from spiritual leprosy. Like every single one of us became before we came to faith in Jesus Christ. So before the Lord healed the man's body, he spoke peace to the man's heart and announced, according to Matthew's account, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. That's something only God can do. And he said it out loud. Forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed. It meets the greatest need, which is salvation. It costs the greatest price, which was Christ on the cross. And it brings the greatest blessing, which is eternal life. Jesus then looked around and he saw what was in the heart of man. He looked around. He saw the critics who had come to spy on him. Luke writes concerning this, chapter 5, verse 17. On one of those days, as he was teaching in this house, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. So again, we know that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law. Pharisees and scribes, they were there. And like I said, they should have been present. They had an, a, a responsibility to investigate this startup ministry. But the problem wasn't that they were there. The problem was what they were there for. They had preconceived notions. They had an agenda. They were trying to accomplish something for their own personal benefit. That was the problem. It was a matter of right attitude and, and right motivation. They had the wrong attitude and the wrong motivation. They didn't come seeking the truth. They didn't come for repentance and confession. They came with an agenda, with critical minds, and what a wonderful lesson this is for the church. To reserve judgment, to approach one another with clean slates, zero, zero scores, presumption of goodwill, Presumption of good intention. Defer to one another out of love for Christ, out of love for the gospel. If you have a concern with someone, reserve your judgment. Come out with your concern. Don't give broad sweeping generalizations that leave people to wonder whether they're in your good graces or not. Just come out and speak the truth in love, according to Matthew chapter 18. This was the beginning of the official opposition that ultimately led to our Lord's arrest and death. Next, Jesus looked within, verses 8 and 9. Jesus looked within. And he saw the critical spirit in the hearts of the Pharisees and the scribes, and he knew that they were accusing him of blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. They were actually right on that point. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus had just told the paralytic that his sins were forgiven. In this scene, what was Jesus' first demonstration of divine power? What was his first demonstration, the first indication of his divine power in this scene? Think through it. What is it? That he was God. 
even before he claimed that. What was it? Omniscience. Omniscience. He read their minds. They didn't speak audibly according to this text or any uh, parallel account. He knew what they were thinking. Now, at this point, you might say, well, I mean, of course, he, he knew what they would have been thinking. No, he knew what they were thinking. And he answered them specifically according to what he knew they were thinking. He, listen, Jesus Christ, incarnate God, never ceased to be God. He set aside his divine prerogatives, but he exercised them whenever he wanted. And he exercised the divine prerogative for omniscience. And he read their minds. That was his first demonstration of his divinity. And they didn't grasp that. I would have been petrified. So knowing their thoughts and that they were thinking and reasoning in their heart, he answered out loud their question with a question and gave them something to really think about. And so he asked, to paraphrase, which is easier, to heal the man or to tell him he is forgiven? Well, on the one hand, it would be easier to say your sins are forgiven because who is going to be able to verify and, and authenticate whether or not that actually happened? I mean, it's how do you prove that? Okay, so he says your sins are forgiven. Even if he does mean in the sense unto salvation your sins are forgiven, how can you prove that they were not? How can you prove that they were? But to say to the paralytic, you're healed, well, now we got to see whether or not he's healed. Now that's got to be proven. Because the only demonstration of, of the reality of that miracle is going to be if the guy gets up and walks out of here. But if he stays there and he goes out on the bed just the way he came in through the roof, but this time out the door, well, we've got a real problem. And Jesus' ministry would have been over in that moment. So Jesus leaps forward, he goes to the man's greatest need, he tells him his sins are forgiven, and he set himself up willingly to the opposition to prove what he came here to prove, which is, I am God. He knew that he had ministry work yet to do. And so he refers to himself as the Son of Man, and this was his favorite designation, was to call himself the Son of Man. It's used about 80 times in the Gospels. It has reference back to Daniel chapter 7, where the Ancient of Days is pictured in the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. It's a reference to the Son of Man, the, who is the Son of God, the Son of the Ancient of Days. It's a messianic title. And the Jews would have interpreted it that way. But Jesus used that phrasing because it's a little more palatable. He has work yet to do. And he's not about to take his ministry to the ultimate climax, which will result in his death on a cross. It's not time for that yet. So he refers to himself as the Son of Man. That phrase that is used 14 times in Mark's gospel. So what we have here is a situation where we have a story, but it's more than just a a fun narrative that we can use multimedia displays, whether they be 19th century displays or 21st century displays. It's more than a story. This is a, a message of great need. This is a narrative that demonstrates the divine authority of Jesus Christ who comes with all compassion, who cares for people and wants to communicate the truth of the gospel and he wants belief and he wants salvation and he's willing in all of that love and compassion to go to a cross 
allowing himself to be nailed to it, blood run down, die, rise again on the third day, and keep preaching some more. That's what he came for. And that's the message that is being communicated here. Our greatest need is spiritual, not physical. And the need has been met by the greatest miracle the Lord Jesus Christ ever performed. He became flesh. He lived a sinless life. He went to the cross to pay the ultimate price to satisfy God's holy wrath against sin. Forgiveness of sin costs the Savior dearly. If you do not enjoy the blessings of his sovereign grace and salvation, call out to him now. If you are assured of your salvation in Christ, then put at the top of your thanksgiving list for prayer this very thing and praise him for salvation that comes only through Jesus' shed blood. And then live your life like you mean it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this time that we've been able to gather together, and I thank you for the truth of the gospel, which is centered on the cross of Jesus Christ, that without forgiveness of sin, there can be no salvation. The only way sins can be forgiven is because of the work of Jesus Christ, because he is the perfect spotless lamb of God, sinless, the only acceptable sacrifice. I thank you for the plan of salvation which comes through your son Jesus. And I just pray that you would work mightily in and through all of us to be the very expression of who and what you intend us to be. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.